My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me now and we will explore these topics and so much more with fascinating guests, authors, and experts who will guide us to Destination Unlimited. Is there a way to take a practical approach to demystifying the mystical, enabling us to implement ancient esoteric truths in our daily lives? My guest this week on Destination Unlimited, Phil Webster, took a personal journey through grief into mediumship and the study of ancient and modern metaphysics. Phil Webster is a writer, actor, and spiritual teacher. After living abroad for 20 years, he returned to the United Kingdom and ventured into acting. After losing his mother in 2021, he realized that he had been dismissing spiritual calls to action his entire life. His website is philwebster.com, and he joins me this week to share his story and his new number one book on Amazon's hot releases chart, Glowing Deeper. Please join me in welcoming to Destination Unlimited, Phil Webster. Welcome, Phil. Thank you, Victor. Nice to nice to be here, and thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us, Phil. Please share with our listeners your early path and what your beliefs were or were not in terms of the spiritual and metaphysical. Sure. Um, so I, I think when I was a kid, I, I remember having this very, uh, I, and I suppose a lot of us do. Of course, people's circumstances are different how they grow up, but I, I felt like I had this very innate sense of knowing that that life was just supposed to be fun. You know, I remember walking to school and, and saying hello to all the trees and stuff like that on the way. And, and that seemed like a, a kind of a, a natural thing to do, you know? Um, and, and I suppose early on it, when I look back on it, I had a, there was a lot of, I, I suppose you could call them paranormal um, experiences around the house, but I kind of, as I grew older, and thought back on these things, I thought, well, did they did they really happen, or was it just you know part of my imagination and what have you? Um, and and yeah, sort of had like a somewhat of a tumultuous uh, childhood, as a lot of us do, like parents breaking up and you know a uh, stepfather that wasn't my greatest fan and <laughs> and all these things. But um, you know, you get through them, um, and then yeah, I sort of hit my teens, and again, like it would seem that something would come along every now and again. I remember coming across a book on astral projection. And thinking that sounded really cool at about 14, 15 years old. Um, and this was kind of early 90s. And, you know, we didn't have much else to do. I, I also, I grew up in a place called the Isle of Wight, which is a very rural place and, and kind of cut off on the rest of England. Um, so there wasn't much to do. So I thought, let's try this astral projection thing. And uh, and very quickly, just like laying there and, and trying to, you know, separate from my body, it happened, and and I uh, and and I was kind of overwhelmed. I didn't really know what to expect, and I remember the thing that that kind of threw me the most was that I had a third perspective. So I could feel myself laying on the bed. I felt myself rise above it, and and I held had these sort of both two different sensations. But then I had a third perspective from the side of the room, which I wasn't counting on at all, and that that was kind of the thing that just was too much, and I just kind of snapped myself out of it. And and a few years later, I remember uh, the, I was watching some TV show, and they had like a somebody call in to speak to a psychic. And this guy described the same third perspective. He said it was as though he were the wall, kind of watching himself float above his body. And I thought, well, all right, maybe that maybe that actually did happen. Then you know, um, so I kind of had a lot of a lot of things that I, I went sort of go into uh, as a kid that that seemed to pop up, and then I sort of just put it all behind me. Um, and just, you know, went through my 20s, traveled around a lot, traveled around the world, lived abroad for for 20 years or so, and um, sort of developed a bit more of a cynical outlook on life as I went through my 30s. And um, so I'll just leave it at that. I kind of put it all behind me. And then all of a sudden, a few major things happened. <laughs> yes, everything changed for you during the transition of your mother. Please tell us what happened. So yeah, um, so I'll, I'll yeah I'll go into that and then maybe backtrack a little bit. So with my mum, my mum was seventy six years old when she passed away, and this was in two thousand one. Uh, sorry, two thousand twenty one. Forgive me. 
at the uh, at just at the tail end of the pandemic. Um, so she lived on this island that I mentioned, and uh, again, it's a very rural place. And we were in you know the various lockdowns and what have you. And I'm based in London after uh, coming back to the UK around 2017. But anyway, so it's a few hours away from me, and I was trying to do the right thing, and and I would go and see her when restrictions were lifted. And we went in lockdowns and what have you. Um, but she grew increasingly lonely over that year, living alone. She had a few various age-related health problems, like high blood pressure and, and stuff like that. But she would always bounce back, you know, from any illness. And I kind of expected her to be around for a while. But anyway, I hadn't seen her for a few months. Um, and it was January 2021. And uh, we would FaceTime every day. And one evening when I called her, and I think it was the third time we spoke that day, uh, she picked up the the phone, and as she did, I saw a man leaning in, a kind of standing beside her. And I saw him long enough that I could describe him. He had thinning gray hair, glasses, looked like he was maybe late 60s, something like that. Um, and I was kind of taken aback, you know, because we were in a lockdown. Nobody should have been there. I knew everybody that was around her. We didn't have any family there. And I was like, well, who's that? And she kind of took moved with the phone, and he went out of shot, and she said, who's what? And I was like, okay, well, I said, well, the guy, I just, I just saw someone. And she was like, no, no, you know, there's no one here. And I said, look, mum, I said, sorry, but I, I just saw someone like, who, who is it? And, um, and she just dismissed it. And I could always tell if there was somebody there, like her, her whole demeanor would change. She would speak a lot posher and, then, you know, put on these airs and graces. And it always used to drive me nuts, but she wasn't doing any of that. And, and I kind of questioned her a couple more times and, she just dismissed it and started talking about her day. And I thought, all right, well, I guess I was mistaken. And and we spoke for maybe a further 45 minutes. And, and it was quite late at night. It was around 10 o'clock. Um, and, you know, I knew all the neighbors and stuff like that. And I thought, all right, well, it, you know, I was mistaken. So I went to bed that night. And the next morning, I, I received a phone call from one of the neighbors that my mom was having a heart attack. And she passed away that morning. So, you know, through the the thick of the grief and, and, and all that you go through when, when you lose somebody close or when you lose a parent, um, my mind kept going back to that. And I was thinking, okay, well, what was that? What are we talking here? You know, I, I believe that there was nobody there. And I thought, are we talking what spirit guides, ghosts? Uh, and none of those things were kind of of interest to me at the time. And, and, and I sort of kept coming back to that and, and it didn't really offer me much comfort uh, because I didn't recognize him. He didn't look like a, an uncle that had passed away or anything like that. Um, so I didn't really know what to do with it. But the, the logical, you know, the, the logical thing to me seemed to be that that, that was a, a supernatural event and somebody was letting me know that she was about to pass. So that, that was really the, the catalyst for me to, um, to dive back into you know, looking into spiritual, into the spiritual aspects of life and what was really the beginning of the book. And you had shared that a few things happened before that. Yeah. So that one of the things that that really did uh, as well as, you know, kind of just give me a, I don't know, a kick up the butt that not to, to look into spiritual things. And, and uh, it, it sort of reminded me about a few other things that had happened over the years. So there was a couple of events in my mid thirties that I, that I sort of, again, just, you know, was happy to put behind me, but then I kind of started looking at it as a, in a different light, uh, as I learned about more spiritual practices. Um, so one specific thing was in my mid thirties, I was living in Helsinki in Finland. Um, and I was running bars and nightclubs at the time. Um, so I kind of had a very cynical outlook on life. You know, every night I was seeing people drunk at the worst, you know, um, I was, sleeping all day, working at night till six in the morning, probably drinking a bit too much myself. Um, and I just kind of, yeah, I was a little bit living a bit of a self-involved life, you know, um, wasn't really thinking of anything else other than, uh, the, than my own kind of pursuits. Um, and I woke up one particular morning, I wasn't drunk or, or anything like that. And, uh, and I just kind of had this thought and it wasn't a new thought, but I was just thinking about how we only have the moment of now and, you know, that is now all the time, essentially. And and I was kind of laying there contemplating this and, and then something very profound shifted. And it was as though I were kind of snapped out of the whatever's going on here and linear time fell away. And it was as though I were above myself observing my own thoughts and everything just suddenly seemed absurd. And, you know, people talk about living in the moment and, you know, sort of being present in the moment of now. 
but this was overwhelming it was it was like that times a thousand and and like i say linear time fell away and all of a sudden it was just like now and it was just now 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 and i was like whoa okay this is this this is too much and i, and I can't emphasize how kind of scary this was it was as though like a spotlight were being shone on me and i was suddenly woken up to to some sort of new version of reality and and it and it was terrifying <laughs> and um I thought, well, okay, and I tried to walk it off, and, th and that didn't work. I, I carried on going to work, and I was trying to explain to people what was going on, and this thing just didn't stop. And it was 24-7, just, just this ultimate awareness of the present moment. I just couldn't switch off. I couldn't think, well, what am I going to eat for dinner later, or what did I do last night? Just my brain wouldn't let up that it was just now, all the time. Um, and it was exhausting. Um, so I kind of went about my – tried to get, you know, thinking that this thing would wear off – and I ended up going to a doctor a few weeks later, and I pretty much explained how I just said it to you. And they said, well, yeah, that sounds like psychosis, um, which wasn't something that I ever thought would be, you know, on my cards, which terrified me. And the doctor gave me a bunch of meds, uh, anti-anxiety pills, sleeping pills, stuff like that. Um, the sleeping pills would knock me out, and then I would wake up and the whole thing would just start over again. Just this ultimate, you know, uh, moment of just being ultra present. And um and, and the anxiety meds didn't touch it. Gave it a couple more weeks, went to another doctor, same diagnosis, psychosis. And I was like, okay, this is just not, you know, I, I was getting scared at this point. It was as though I felt like I was hanging on by like a, a slippery, hanging on to like a slippery bar by my fingernails of, of, of whatever I thought reality was. And I got to say, it was overwhelming and, and it just didn't let up. And I, maybe about three months in, I started thinking, well, okay, if this is the way that my brain's going to work now, and I don't mean to take this down the dark path, but I thought, well, I'm out of here. This just this doesn't work for me. You know, I, I really felt like I was losing my mind, um, and I, I ended up finding a psychiatrist, and and amazingly, this guy was, and I was in Helsinki still, but this guy was like the one medical professional that seemed to understand sort of more spiritual. Um, had a more spiritual outlook on things. And he was like, no, 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 man. He was like, you're fine. You're, ha you're having an awakening. That's what's going on. And I was like, okay, well, whatever, just, just make it stop. You know, I would just want to get back to the herd and uh, get on with my life, you know? And um, anyway, he gave me a very basic grounding meditation and almost instantly brought me back. Um, I mean, it didn't, it didn't last that this whole kind of thing started up again, but I just did this meditation every day and very, very gradually, I kind of started, you know, sort of coming back online or, or, or offline, depending on which way you, <laughs> which way you look at this whole thing. Um, and yeah, you know, it would get to the point that I would have one good day in the week, then it was two good days and a little bit later. And then, you know, over the course of about a year, I, I sort of, you know, returned to normal. And I was like, well, thank God that was over and put it behind me. But um, one of the things that he'd said uh, at the time in my mid thirties that he believed that I was a mystic. And I was like, well, what the hell does that mean? Right. And and he was talking about things like shamanic sickness and all these other things I, I wasn't really interested in. And, um, you know, I just put the, the whole experience behind me. So that was one thing. And that was a pretty major one. Um, but yeah, there, there were a couple more, but I, I feel like I talked to, <laughs> talked a bit too long about that. No, not not at all. So you had these experiences, then you had the transition of your mother and the experience that happened then. How did these things change your life and lead you to the pursuit to, of learning about mediumship? Yeah, well, I, I would say that, like I say, I, I kind of put that one behind me. And then I, I when I started looking back on it, it would seem that about every five years or so, it was as though something were tapping me on the shoulder, you know, and I, and up until my mum passed, I, I just ignored it or I dealt with it the best way I could and, and then put it behind me, like the like the experience I just talked about. But after losing my mum, I mean, I'm sure some of your listeners have, have been through this as well. And, you know, it's such a life-changing thing. It's, it's, you know, there was this person that's just been the witness to your whole life and they're suddenly not there anymore. And it's, it's you know, it felt like stepping into an alternate reality. You know, there was one where... My mom was here, and then there's one where she wasn't. And, um, you know, it changed everything. It really felt like, even though I'm in my late 40s, it really felt like that whatever last, I don't know, piece of childhood was left or was, was you know, absolutely gone. You know, it's just me now. And it, I, and it, I suppose it really took the wind out of me. Um, and I was just kind of slowly beginning to obsess over what the who the guy on the call was. Um, so I started reading some sort of, uh, you know, the standard sort of spiritual literature like Neil Donald Walsh and, and things that I'd 
read over the years here and there. Um, and then that led me to a book by a medium called Claire Broad. So Claire, I didn't know who she was when I picked the book up. Uh, she could have been from the States or Australia or the UK or whatever. And um, and I started reading this book and, and it opened with her opening scene was taking a place across the street from where I lived in London uh, at a cemetery that I could see from my window, which I thought was like, okay, well, that's kind of weird. You know, like <laughs> she could have been from anywhere. And there was this instant connection. Like I could literally look out of my window and see what she was talking about in the first chapter of a book. And I read her whole book and very shortly afterwards, um, I noticed that she had a class coming up at a, at a place called the college of psychic studies in London, which sounded I'd heard of it before, and I thought it sounded ridiculous. <laughs> like I don't know, I was like, "Well, what, what's this? Like the X Men school or something?" And anyway, I um I ended up going along to her class, and and I told her those stories that I told you, along with a couple of others. And she was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah that that makes perfect sense." And she kind of gave me a very different perspective on it all to to you know other people kind of dismissing it, um, and almost kind of took me under her wing. And, and she just, yeah, she kind of opened the door to mediumship. And then the next kind of thing that, that was really the game changer was walking into a spiritualist church one night and uh, a lady was given a demonstration of mediumship. So nobody knew that I was showing up. And this was really my first experience with, with a medium um, outside of Claire's book and probably before I met Claire, I must say. And uh, this lady, she was going around the, the church, around the small congregation there and giving people evidence of people that had passed over. And she was getting affirmation after affirmation. And I was thinking, okay, well, this seems to be like a, this thing seems legit. You know, people were bursting into, bursting into tears and, and you know, just like confirming everything she was talking about. And she eventually came to me and, and she started talking about a young man um, that had passed away when we were, when I was young. And, and I, uh, to be honest, I had no idea what she was talking about for about five or 10 minutes. And then she started talking about me becoming a medium. And or being a voice for spirit was how she put it. And I was like, well, funny, because I just started reading about this stuff. But anyway, I, I didn't really have any aspiration for that. And then right at the end, and, and then I kind of finally realized who she was talking about. And I realized she was talking about a friend of mine who'd passed away when we were both like early 20s. And then, um, and then she said, oh, well, I, I have a lady here that's passed very recently. And, um, and she described my mom physically. And I kind of got a lump in my throat, you know. Um, and the game changer was really that, the lady, the the medium, her her accent changed. So she had a very strong London Cockney accent, um, and then suddenly she switched to this Northern English accent, which which was like what my mum sounded like. And she just she just used my mum's words, you know. Um, and and it was a very brief message, but again, that that really changed everything. That was kind of another thing that just was like, all right, this is um, I'm looking at everything differently now, um, and just confirmed for me that. That, that I believe that my mum, you know, was still a witness to my life. Um, and that, that really opened the door. And, and I thought, well, I'm going to start documenting this because um, there's quite a lot here already, you know. And, uh, and over the course of that next year, I had so many amazing things happen um, that, that I write about in the book. And, and through the book, I've just kind of um, told my story. Uh, and the book's called Letting Glow, by the way. That's the first book. Um, and, and, you know, in, in theory, the reader could um, go along with me, do the meditations that are in there and possibly open up um, and maybe go towards mediumship if that's an interest of this. And that was your first book, as you mentioned last year, the part of a trilogy yeah. called Letting Glow, A Guide to Intuition, Spirituality and Living Consciously. What else did you share with your readers in that book? I pretty much, I, I just, I was kind of writing, I suppose you could call it in real time. So uh, as I was learning, I was just writing all these things down and, you know, I was pouring my grief into it also. So it's a bit of a mixed bag and, and I feel like it might be a bit of a people. Some people have told me that it's difficult to categorize the book because I'm talking about my personal grief that I, that I hope would possibly help somebody else that might be going through the same thing. Um, I'm learning about all these amazing things, uh, spiritual, spirituality wise, and and then it's kind of autobiographical as well because I then sort of go back and document all these um, things that would happen every few years, you know, in a spiritual sense. Um, so yeah, by the end of it, I feel that you know the reader, it's almost like a soft introduction to spirituality would be the way that I would put it. Yeah. And how did you arrive at the title "Letting Glow"? Well, it was just a, a play on on grief, really. Um, you know, I was kind of coming to terms with the with losing my mum but then I was learning about all these amazing things that that was just opening up this whole new world for me 
Um, and I really felt like, okay, the, I've, I've always been someone that's never really found my place in the world. You know, I've, I've dabbled with this and that, but I never really found a, a solid career path or I couldn't really get excited about making money for somebody else, you know, um, anything like that. And it started feeling like, oh, this, this feels like this has been my thing all along, you know, and especially when I kind of went back and, and reevaluated all these, uh, all these signs uh, along the way that I just ignored <laughs> and uh, everything kind of fell into place. And it was almost, almost like a parting gift from my mom, you know, um, in, in, in a weird way. So it was this very bittersweet kind of uh, of journey. Um, so yeah, I want, I wanted to acknowledge that I'm, you know, letting go of, uh, you know, that, that part of my life, but also that something new was starting. Absolutely. It seems that it's really important to you to demystify the mystical. Why so? Absolutely. Um, I think that, you know, we all have these uh, moments of, of, of and, and, you know, and this is coming from somebody as well, like I say myself, when I, I did become very cynical for a while, but we still have these moments of, of intuition and, and, you know, knowing where you walk into the room and you can say you can cut the air with a knife if someone's been having an argument. And we all agree that that's, that's a real thing or, you know, um, we can't put our finger on something or uh, we have all these terms, but then if you start using words like uh, clairsentience or clairaudience or, or something like that, then pe people typically, you know, like just sort of dismiss you and look at you like you're nuts. But I think we're essentially talking about the same thing. Um, you know, I think that we're talking about a sixth sense um, and it's just a question of semantics at the end of the day, you know, um, it's just, a, just the way that you want to kind of approach it. And I, and I feel like that we all have uh, probably have these mystical experiences here and there, but they're always typically so fleeting that we just dismiss them, you know, and move on. So I, I that's kind of what I mean by demystifying the mystical. I think we all have these moments, um, but it just takes a, a while to kind of acknowledge them and then tune in. I had one. My mother passed away in January of 2020. Oh, okay. And Sorry thank you. That. Yes. And and she was 86 at the time and she had been ill for quite some time. But uh I had this vision of circles and rings in my mind's eye after her passing and it kept, continued for several several months and it manifested a poem that came through me that I think you would appreciate. I'd like to share it with you if I may. Please do. Yeah. It says the path of great beauty in so many things from atoms to galaxies circles and rings natural wisdom that dwells there within from naught to 360 that magical spin we circle each other in gravity's dance as gaia circles soul the solar romance as luna circles us in life-giving motion drawing the tides and inner emotion and the age of the oak is found in its rings as in woman and man and all living things and when the rings stop and life comes to an end we'll all circle back and dance once again beautiful beautiful yeah. i think that that uh that pretty much sums it all up <laughs> yeah, very nicely thank you my guest is phil webster his latest book is entitled glowing deeper phil please tell our listeners where they can get your books and find out more about you Absolutely. Um, so you can get both books at all the usual uh, retailers, Barnes and Noble, and and everywhere else, um, and uh, and of course on Amazon. And yeah, to, getting hold of me. My name's uh, Phil Webster, so that's Phil with two L's. So philwebster.com, and uh, I'm on Instagram and TikTok and all that stuff as well. And we'll be back with more of Phil after these words on the Ohm Times Radio Network, the cutting edge of conscious radio. Ohm Times Radio, IOM FM. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week is Phil Webster. His new book is entitled Glowing Deeper. Phil, what inspired you to write the second book in your trilogy, Glowing Deeper? So when I'd finished Letting Glow, um, like I say, it was a very cathartic kind of, um, it definitely helped me through that first year of grief. Um, but I'd learned so much about what well, well, through mediums and and learning about different spiritual practices that I felt 
by the end of it that I, that I'd moved on in leaps and bounds from the beginning, you know, and and I felt like immediately I just wanted to carry on. Also, felt a little bit of a loss when I finished the first book, and um, not that I wasn't dealing with the grief, I was very much, very much dealing with it and and in the thick of it, and just kind of letting it letting it all um, manifest. But I just felt like, yeah, I've got I've got another book right here already. Um, so the second book's kind of less about my journey, although it's in there. Um, but it's more about, you know, uh, just sort of like, a again, going a little bit further with, with different spiritual practices. I also kind of thought, well, what would I like to read about? So the, there's a lot of stuff in there. There's a In the middle of it, I've just decided to go off on a, a sort of a bit of a, if you can call it fun section about talking about esoteric traditions such as um what what i believe are the origins of witchcraft um there's some um stuff about so <laughs> very basically things about shamanism um celtic traditions and, and and things like that the history of the tarot all those kind of things and how are those paths relevant to a book about raising one's consciousness yeah well interestingly as i as i wrote them they all sort of and uh, this is how these things tend to work out you know i didn't really know where i was going with these things but at the end of it i thought well that it all tied in nicely you know um especially when i was talking about witchcraft i just sort of dove into that because i found it very interesting i'd recently started a a course at the university of barcelona about studying um witchcraft in the middle ages and and i found the whole thing really fascinating you know because as we're talking now, back back in the day, we'd have we'd have been burned at the stake already, you know. <laughs> we're talking like this, um, so it was su- such an interesting history, and and I definitely learned a lot through that. But one interesting kind of thing that I found about it was, you know, uh, people, especially in this country or in the UK in general, uh, believing in you know fairies and elves and and all that kind of stuff, which wasn't really something that I've ever taken that seriously. I kind of realized that I was being a little bit disrespectful. There's such a rich history there, you know, and it's tied into medicine and food and and all these things that, you know, we sort of, um, we, that, that have turned into our everyday lives today. And, and we've got all these sayings and, and all these kind of things that, that really tie back to these ancient traditions. And, and I feel that a lot of it was just early manifestation techniques. And at the end of the day, if, if um, somebody was to cast a spell or a curse or, you know, a spell of protection or any of those things. They're essentially just, I mean, the way that I see it, and I hope I'm not going to offend any any wicker, wicker people here, um, you know, given affirmations or, uh, you know, sort of desires for the future or, you know, like like what you want to happen. You're just speaking it into reality and, and concentrating on that. And, and I saw parallels between, you know, how um, we talk today about manifesting our best lives and, and all that kind of fun stuff. What did you discover in your studies about feminine mysticism and feminine magic a lot um it's just just a very unfair treatment of of uh, particularly of women um as we all as we all know you know from even if you haven't really looked that deeply into it we all know about the the saint and witch trials and and all that kind of stuff um yeah I, one thing that i found really fascinating was uh, and i'll just have to look at my notes here because unfortunately this stuff doesn't <laughs> roll off my tongue so easily but yeah towards the end of the 1200s there was um there was a uh, somebody they, they were called begins um it's not spelt it's, it's kind of you would pronounce it like begin but it's it's got more of a, a twist to it when you spell it um but it was kind of like a new ge- genre of mysticism that that evolved into a kind of a a speculate speculative kind of sense of knowing rather than the rhetoric of the religion at the time and pretty much how we experience mediumship and spirituality today and it, it had its basis in christianity but it was more to do with just you know believing that the the divine or the universe or the all that is uh, at, at an intuitive level um was really you know where it's at rather than rather than for, for following the you know the religious doctrines of the time and and i, I just found these these characters very interesting so they, they were they weren't nuns, but they almost did the the job of nuns. But they didn't have the um, the confines of the church. But they would work with nuns and they would work with monks. But they started getting the blame for a lot of stuff because they were kind of spouting this very um, you know poetic rhetoric of of spirituality. And essentially, the church didn't like them and and just started burning them at the stake. Um, there was one story that I came across uh, about. And this, sorry, this. How can I put this it, it, without it sounding too uh, too graphic? So they lived in uh, next door to the monastery of monks around this period of time, and monks started talking of having very 
overly pleasant dreams. I think that's the politest way to put it. And the immediate culprit was uh, these these women, these uh, begins that that got the blame because they were the ones that were, you know, spouting all of this um, free love kind of stuff. And I really feel that that was, of course, uh, uh, the witch was mentioned in the Bible as well. Um, but it really felt like that was the beginning of of the witch as we kind of know her today. Um, and they essentially, yeah, that that's where the burning at the stake started um, and went through the fifteenth to eighteenth centuries. And yeah, the, the, uh, again, these women, they, they lot of wrote, uh, wrote a lot of poetry, published some poetry and uh, refused to sort of, you know, um, take them off bookshelves. And, and yeah, they, they essentially started, the church started burning them at the stake and turned witch hunting into a, into a, into a thing. Now, I wonder if men had started this practice, if they would have received the same punishment. Exactly. I wonder. I wonder. Yeah, there was more to it that I that I'd like to say, but it's not it's not on the uh on the top of my head. But yeah, there there was a lot around that as well. That that uh, you know, initially and we're going back to sort of ancient Mesopotamia, the women had the you know, the, they were very much revered like as, as healers and, and spiritual healers and and at some point, from what I understood, men just didn't really like this anymore and, and sort of stepped in and took on the role of uh, exorcists and, and and all these kind of things and um, control. It's all about control. Unfortunately. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it manifests in many different ways, not only in that way. So uh, well, very well, unfortunate. Uh, yeah. Just just to finish that up, like the, one of the most fascinating things as well was the the so that we had something in the UK called the Witchcraft Act, which essentially was you know legal witch hunting, um, and that wasn't abolished until 1951. Which oh my is, goodness. I mean, I don't think anyone was doing it anymore, but but if you did, it would be legal. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Madness. Unbelievable. Yeah. Please share with us about your time studying with the shamans. Well, I've met a couple of interesting people along the way. Um, I, I was always a fan of coming to the States. Um, I traveled around Mexico uh, briefly. And well, I, when I say briefly, I didn't really stay in any one place uh, for, for very long. Um, also around the Caribbean, um, I was kind of lucky enough to to see all that. I would love to see much more of uh, America, that's for sure, and Canada too. But yeah, along the way, I, I was lucky enough to to study with a couple of shamans. Uh, one man called uh, Puma Singh Gona and Manari Ushigora, who is uh, um, part of the Sapara Nation. Uh, I'm not going to sort of go into their story. I think it's their story, but I, I what I found was the what I was really intrigued by were the very much the similarities between their their way of looking at the world and and essentially mediumship like i i felt that a lot of what they talked about especially meditation and journeying as as they would call it um they're essentially you know guided meditations like like we would do today um and and i felt like there was very strong parallels between their beliefs and particularly with uh, mediumship yeah I had taken a class many years ago, and there was a teacher who was a shaman from South America. Yeah. And he used to talk about, in the practice that he did, of sitting down and allowing the energy field to open up before him and being able to see and identify aberrations in the energy field and being able to work with and correct those. Did you experience that also? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it all sounds very familiar. I think that, I mean, this sound, if I'd have heard somebody say this a few years ago, I would have just instantly dismissed it. But in learning about mediumship and, and learning about spirit guides, um, you know, it seems that everybody in their, in their grandmother in these communities has a, has a uh, indigenous uh, American um, a, a, as a spirit guide, you know, and um almost to the point that it's slightly offensive, I think. So I'm sort of trying to tread very lightly here. But I did have a, a really fascinating experience that in meditation that the, uh, a lady sort of appeared and presented herself to me and she presented herself as a young Native American, um, which I thought was amazing. And, and I got a couple of words come through and this sounds a little bit random or, or whatever, but um, humblebee was one strange word that came through. And it was very, the whole vision was like part of nature and she presented me with a with a sunflower and then this word humble be stuck with me and i thought well what a strange way to talk about a bee right um i'd never heard anyone say that before and i kind of looked this up just you know this um this term up straight after the meditation and apparently that was like a a, a way to describe a, a bumblebee the, the the um 
that it was yeah that they, that they would refer to them as humblebees and i've never heard of this before and they kind of just you know these things tend to pop in that that i believe aren't part of you know something that i've heard before and i've just sort of stored away or, or what have you there's been more profound things than that um but the next night i i did go to watch another demonstration of mediumship and when the way i talk about this i was only doing it probably only did it five or six times um at the same church and and the medium came to me and he immediately brought up something about um a native american lady with me and i said well that's kind of interesting because i believe i met her last night you know um and and pretty much described what i saw so that really you know piqued my interest in in looking into those traditions as well but yeah i feel like it's almost a a, a rite of passage uh, <laughs> as a developer medium to sort of uh look into look into those um traditions and you know sort of it's, it's it's a very sensitive subject because again i don't want to i don't want to you know fringe on on any cultural appropriation you know so I, I feel like that, that it's um yeah that it's it's kind of a i i sort of dove into it headlong thinking well this is amazing and learning all of these things and and then sort of as of step back a little i thought well is it mine to share you know it's not it's not really my story i'm just kind of um, just fascinated by the, again, by the similarities. There's a fascinating section in Glowing Deeper that goes very deeply into the metaphysics of time and living in the now, which is something you had experienced. Please elaborate on this and what inspired it. Well, I just think it's such a, you know, it's, it's such an interesting thing. Like I had that very overwhelming experience that, that very much left a mark on me. And I feel that that keeps coming up again and again like I, I keep coming back to that as much as i'm very much interested in mediumship um it seems to be that that i feel that that's my i don't know if it's a gift but after that whole experience that i had i felt like i, I came away with a very well new way of looking at the world i felt a lot humbler i felt like my ego had been smashed to pieces you know i, I very much thought that i was um sort of going out of my mind for one of a better term um I would never, you know, sort of dismiss mental illness of anyone's anymore. But, um, uh, but it was, it was such an overwhelming experience that it, it kind of left a trace with me, and I felt very able to to just sort of tune into the moment of now, kind of at will, you know. Um, and I found, I know a lot of people find meditation quite difficult or visualization and and things like that, and I feel like it comes kind of easy, and and I believe that it was probably to do with that experience, you know, of, of just sort of tuning right into this moment. But yeah, um, you know, if you look to science, it seems to be that they've got two very different schools of thought on it. And one is that there is a an A to B, you know, that we have a past and we have a, a future or we're, or we're at the end of this timeline that is that is moving forward. And we've all got these shared experiences in the past that we can agree upon and that's behind of and behind us, forgive me. And then, you know, the other other sense is that there is only now. And there's always only ever been now, and and that is ultimate reality. And 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 time, as we as we measure it, doesn't really exist because it's just now all the time. And that opens up a huge um, a huge conversation. <laughs> like I don't even know how to articulate it um, just off the top of my head. But essentially, well, if everything's sorry, you no, know, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Well, you know, if 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 all we ever had have had is now, and 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 all we've got is now, then then it sort of opens up the idea that. You know everything that's ever happened is happening right now and everything that could ever happen is possibly happening right now on you know and, and that sort of goes into multi-dimensions and and the theory that there are different timelines going off in every direction that we can switch to and and that's really sort of where when people talk about manifestation you know um that that essentially leads to that and you share a series of wonderful meditations in glowing deeper and one of them is just about that about living in the now would you share it with us Absolutely. Yeah. It's a very light one. Um, it's not, you know, no one's going to end up uh, having the experience that I had for, firsthand of, but this is, um, I think this is a really nice introduction to just sort of being with the, with the present moment and, and, and it's beneficial, I think, no matter what kind of direction you're going, um, whether you're interested in mediumship or not, I, I feel that we could all just, you know, take a moment and just be aware of our surroundings. Another benefit to this one is it that it's, if you find meditation difficult, this is one way you can really use your surroundings or any sort of distractions actually to take you deeper into it. So first of all, uh, sit in a comfortable position with a straight back, close your eyes, and then take a few deep grounding breaths, either through your nose or mouth, whichever you prefer. 
Now let your breathing return to normal and simply pay attention to it for a few moments. If your brain attempts to distract you with random thoughts, then just bring your focus back to your breath. Next, begin to notice your heartbeat. Feel it in your chest. Notice the beautiful symmetry between your heart beating and your breath flowing in and out. Out of sync, but completely in unison. Meditate on your heartbeat. Your mother's heartbeat was the first thing that you experienced in your suspended state in the womb. Even if you are unable to physically hear, you can still tune into your own rhythm of your own heart and your breath. The breath flows in and out. The heart dictates the rhythm of your life, and you can always connect back to your original home, the heartbeat that your mother passed from herself to you. Take time to sit with it now and explore the deeper connections that you have. Now begin to notice the sounds in your environment. In fact, take all of your attention to the sounds in your environment. Imagine that for the time being, it's your only sense. Scan the world around you for sound. Notice as many as you can. Spend a few seconds on each sound and then move to the next. Don't give them a backstory. Just simply hear them, note them, and move on. A clock ticking, a car passing by, a dog barking, a door being slammed, the washing machine whirring. Now slowly, expand your hearing to distant sounds. Maybe there's a train rolling by somewhere far away. Perhaps there's the laughter of children on a playground across the street. Focus for a few seconds on each sound. Zoom in on it with your ears. Let the other sounds fall away as your focus becomes laser-like and moves across great distances to experience the sound in the here and the now. All you're doing is listening and being aware. Now bring your awareness back to your breath and pay attention to it. Listen to the sound of your breathing and let it connect you with your place in the world, in the here and the now. Let all of the sounds around you blend with the sound of your breath. Whatever sounds arise, simply take note of them in an unbreaking stream of awareness of the ongoing moment of now. There is only now. When you're ready, let the sounds drift back out to your peripheral awareness and bring your attention back to your physical self, sitting in the present moment. Feel your feet on the floor, feel your hands on your lap, the arms of your chair. Become aware of any itches or glitches throughout your body. Take a deep breath and open your eyes. Thank you so much for sharing that with us and helping us to achieve that state of being in the now without the distractions that <laughs> normally interrupt our day. My guest is Phil Webster. His book is called Glowing Deeper. We'll be back with more Phil after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Imagine yourself being transported to India to the banks of the Ganga and an ashram in Rishikesh. Visualize that you are welcome to satsang with an American sannyasi who shares the wisdom of her guru. Your visualization has manifested. Join Satvi Bhagawati Saraswati for inspiration and transformation every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern on Om Times Radio. More than 24 million Americans have an autoimmune disorder, and that number continues to grow. I'm Sharon Saylor, and I'm one of those 24 million. To put that number in perspective, cancer affects about 9 million and heart disease up to 22 million. That's why I've brought together top experts and those thriving regardless of their diagnosis to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information. Join me, Sharon Saylor, Friday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, for the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio to find out how to live your life uninterrupted. If I could be you. And you could be me. For just one hour. If you could find a way. To get inside. Each other's mind. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk Walk a mile mile in in my my shoes. shoes. We've all felt left out. And for some, 
that feeling lasts more than a moment. We can change that. Learn how at belongingbeginswithus.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Walk a mile in my shoes. So I'm a cat, and I just moved in with this new human, and she's got this little toy she's always playing with, all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this. She even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese, and guess what? Egg rolls showed up like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the ShelterPetProject.org. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this week is Phil Webster, his new book, Glowing Deeper. Phil, you had touched upon this a little bit earlier. How do our memories connect us to the metaphysical experience? Absolutely. I feel that... um you know, the, the usually like every every memory that we have, like, you know, fits nicely into something that we can relate to. You know, when we experience something, um, we typically have like a, a comparison to to an event from the past that we can, you know, compare it to and and then it becomes relatable. Um, you know, based on your likes and dislikes, you know, and this happens like in an instant. For example, you know, you'll see somebody, let's say, at a party that has red hair and that person will remind you of somebody else that, you know, who had red hair and um and you'll make an instant decision sort of based on them whether whether you like them or not um but you know or, or or you can be walking down a street and you know um a car will go over a bump and make a loud bang and make a jump but then instantly your brain will be like okay i recognize that and, and i don't know what that means a car going over a bump makes a loud noise there's no threat and you get on with your day but i also feel that you know when we have a, a mystical experience the brain then tries to do the same thing it kind of tries to relate it to something that's happened in the past and uh, but it recognizes the experience is new and and it kind of doesn't know what to do with it you know because it's not it's not familiar territory so i think that these experiences they often come in as feelings um you, you know either as a physical feeling that doesn't have any logic behind it like for example your your hair stands up on the the back of your neck or something like that or then it's just a, typically like a, an innate sense of knowing that that's that's purely subjective and, and brand new and and you've got no experience to compare it with and you know so or sometimes you know you'll see something that doesn't make any sense such as a, a man standing next to your mum on a on a visit a video call you know um so I, I feel that the first few times that we have something like this happen you know we, we easily dismiss them um particularly when they happen out of context to you know the rest of your day but i think that when we start taking note of them um then they start happening more often and and you know i suppose a skeptic could say that well you know when you start looking for these kind of you know intangible things then then you're going to see more of them but i feel that that's truly how it works and and the experiences that i had over that first year in particular when i really started taking note of them and and then sitting in meditation and kind of opening myself up to these um to these events that you know that i was welcoming welcoming in um, they, they did start happening more often, and then I did have something to compare them to, and and there was a few sort of quite profound ones that the you know that that I experienced that the other people that I was with experienced, and then again learning about mediumship, you know, some of the you know, I'm very much at the start of my journey with it, but in practice, some of the um, information that I've gave to people, um, I, I know that I don't know those things, you know, um, I'll just go with what I see. And, and and so far, so good. You know, I, I seem to be getting a pretty good su- success rate with it. So I think at the end of the day, yeah, you know, you just got to uh, really, the key is just, just start trusting your intuition and, and you know, what, what really feels true to you. And, and I think the key to, to finding that is, again, back to meditation. One of the gifts that have graced my life since my mid to late 30s have been synchronicities which are meaningful coincidences without causal connection, according to uh, the uh, Carl Jung, who defined it that way. And I found that every time one of these synchronicities occur, I have three choices. I could either say, dismiss it out of hand. I could say, you know, that's interesting, but not right now. Or I could say, yes, and embrace it right now. And every time I would say that big why, yes, the next one would come and the next one would come. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, I believe it is. I believe it is. Yeah, it's worth taking notes of these things. You know, um, I, I just feel like again, I, I I know I sort of keep harping back to 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 meditation again, but I feel that that's really the key 
to you know we we all have uh, and i'm not the first person to say this but we all you know we've, we've got these constant this constant barrage of thoughts coming in you know we're, we're thinking about up, up team you know things at the same time um and i feel that when you can just take a few moments to to step back from that and realize that we're not those thoughts and that you're kind of this observer at the back of it all watching this whole thing play out then you begin to recognize that inner voice you know and, and the more you get to recognize that inner voice i feel that that that's the one that takes notice. That's like the the silent observer in the background that will tell you that when these things do come up, whatever they may be, um, mystical events of all sorts. I can't think of an example. Um, then you start to realize, ah, oh, I think these are these are actually a thing, and and you start taking notice. And yeah, and I believe that synchronicities, especially, um, the thing seems to start flowing when when you can get into that into that state of 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 just trusting your intuition. What is what you call the slipstream superhighway? Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I think that's just acknowledging that that we really have this that there's this you know other other kind of other realities that are running alongside us that that we don't really take any notice of. You know, we get caught up in paying the bills and and you have to right you know we are having a physical experience we you know bills have to be paid um you know you, you got to feed your kids <laughs> we got to you know do all these things to make ends meet but i think there is something a, a more subtler world uh running along beside us and, and i believe that if you once you jump onto it then you can really you know just just jump on for the ride and that's uh yeah that's what i'm talking about the slipstream superhighway and i also believe that you know that that kind of branches out into talking about. Uh, I think a popular term in in spiritual communities at the moment is uh, talking about shifting timelines and you know sort of uh, seeing yourself on that on that timeline where where you would rather be. And I genuinely believe that it's possible. As nuts as this sounds, and I would have thought this was nuts a few years ago, um, it's very genuinely possible to jump over onto one of those timelines. Yeah. How may we learn to find and connect with our guides and more importantly, listen to them? Absolutely. Um, again, sorry, I'm like a broken record with this, but meditation um, is really is the key. And uh, and if, if you know, somebody finds it difficult to to kind of sit in, in the stillness for a moment, one thing you really don't have to do is, you know, try too hard. Like, don't worry, we're, we're going to get distracted by thoughts. You know, when I sit in meditation, I'm getting distracted by my thoughts all the time the key is to just come back to the breath and just come back to the moment and come back to your physical self and then and then the the thoughts tend to sort of go out keep going in the background once you don't take any notice of them and i feel like when you good, get good at recognizing that you're not part of that whole you know passing parade that's just going to keep trying to distract you all the whole time then you start to become aware of your own voice and then if you were so inclined to look into or, or reach out to spirit guides um you do start to to recognize when when another voice comes in that that's neither your intuition or your uh you know passing parade of thoughts then you begin to recognize that the that space for for more to come in yeah i've been blessed with that throughout my life and in particular like i shared uh in my mid to late 30s but one story stands out in particular for me personally in 1975 i was in the united states air force and i was stationed in korea and one morning i heard the voice say your mother needs to hear from you she needs to hear your voice uh, she's ill and you must call her and i always listened to that voice yeah. and so six thousand miles away from korea and new york i called one morning and my mother, and in those days we had extension telephones, my sister answered the phone simultaneously. And I said, Mom, is there anything wrong? And my sister says, oh my God, how did he find out? And it hmm. turned out she was scheduled for major surgery the next day, and the voice told me to tell her the surgery would be a complete success, she'd have a complete and quick recovery, everything would be fine. She needed to hear those words from me, and obviously that's what transpired afterwards. So I've always learned to listen to that voice. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I, I you know, uh, this has been a that that's a beautiful story. Absolutely. Um, yeah, for me, you know, this I'm I'm nearing my fifties, and this is the first time that I've that I've started to listen to it. You know, the the last couple of years. Um, yeah, I wish I'd have, I wish I'd have done it earlier. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like readers to take away from glowing deeper? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's it, really. Like, if you are interested in in, I feel like glowing deeper is a bit more of a intermediate. Um, 
intermediate sort of journey um the, the, the meditations in their range and i've actually marked them as you know sort of beginner and intermediate meditations um but it's probably i would say letting glow like i say is more like a soft introduction to to spirituality glowing deeper is kind of a little bit more for the for the seasoned practitioner um but yeah there are lots of lots of meditations in there observations on grief um i was kind of you know observing my own journey as i went along the way and then yeah a lot a lot about different esoteric traditions really um and, and i feel that there's a lot just again about what we've been talking about um and, and and i feel that you know from revisiting these things for example tuning into your to your childhood self there's a there's a great meditation to do that and and when you kind of can go back to tap into what you really wanted to do you know before before everything else got in the way i feel like it can be a very beneficial beneficial journey yeah my guest is Phil Webster. His brand new book, which actually comes out February 1st, is called Glowing Deeper. Phil, please share with our listeners again where they can get your books and find out more about you. Absolutely. So, yeah, the main stopping point, I guess, is uh, Amazon. Uh, we can all get our books from there. Um, it's available as a as a digital book also. Barnes & Noble and all of the wonderful bookstores. And if you have an independent bookstore, you're still blessed to have an independent bookseller near you. Go to that, go to that bookseller and say, I want a copy of Blowing Deeper. Definitely. Bill, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing everything that you've shared. Thank you for having me on. It's been It's been great talking to you. And thank you for joining us on Destination Unlimited. I'm Victor, the voice Herman. Have a wonderful week.